podcast is part of the Sports Social Podcast Network. Thanks for choosing this free Anfield Index podcast. If you'd prefer to listen to this or any of our other shows without adverts, then now's the time to check out Anfield Index Pro. With AI Pro, you can supercharge your entire listening experience. You'll not only get all of our podcasts without the ads, but you'll have them far faster with our quick publish feature available exclusively for subscribers. AI Pro also puts you in the heart of our sound studio with an option to listen to many of our shows live and interact with the podcasters in real time as the shows are recording. Upgrading couldn't be easier. AI Pro is available on all popular podcast platforms. Just head on over to AnfieldIndexPro.com and get started today. Hello and welcome to the Daily Red, your lunchtime catch-up on all things Liverpool. On a Monday, the 5th of August, when young Hendrick is taking his absolute Irishman's right to not work on a bank holiday, and so you're stuck with me instead. And of course, what we'll do is try to walk around whatever is current in terms of the major websites and the stories there on. And just before we start, a little mention for something that is a new development for me here personally, which is watching preseason friendlies. You may be able to relate to the idea that football is obviously a passion, but also kind of a gig during the year for me. I mean, apart from games I've actually been at, which have been, you know, tragically few because of, well, money. Uh, the every single Liverpool game for the last whatever it is now five six years since we've been doing Raw has been spent beside a laptop during the game making notes so football can become a little bit of if not a chore then a responsibility uh, uh, in a way that it, it, it did not used to be so for the last few seasons I have not had any interest in in engaging with anything to do with pre-season, primarily because who cares and it's all about fitness and getting fitness into the legs, but also then as well because it delayed uh, until the very, very last minute me having to engage in a serious way with matches. But I found myself, like I say, I think they started all the, the games I saw, the two games I saw, or three games I saw actually started kind of around about the quarter to one kind of mark in the morning. Uh, And sitting there happily watching them. Um, And, you know, what can we tell from those when there's so few of the first team squad? It was actually quite comical to watch um, the bit coming out yesterday from the club, uh, showing Virgil and um, Trent and all the lads pitching up, Luis Diaz and all these regular first teamers pitching up um, at um, the training ground to get started on their pre-season. And you're never more aware of how little significance really these friendlies have these pre-season friendlies have because like I say you're looking at half first team around the table and you're thinking okay well what can we learn from this and again just to feed into something we're going to speak about later on some of the guys who feature really really prominently in this pre-season stuff are probably on their way out the door too so what can we take from them? Why watch it? Why get involved to the extent that you're staying up half the night to watch it? Now, aside altogether from the concept of fandom, I actually was just curious because I've been really eager to see the beginning of the slot era. Ever since Jürgen announced he was going, all I wanted to do was get to the next stage and that's just how I am and I don't... Whereas I can be incredibly sentimental, I didn't want to wallow in all that mawkish stuff until the very, very, very last minute, which was the last game of Jürgen's era. I got into it then, but until then, I just refused to acknowledge any of it. And always through that era, even though it ironically invigorated Jürgen to say he was going and the team started to do really well and it looked like there could be something on, something massive on until the death there, I just... I was eager for the new start. So the new start has begun and it was kind of really interesting to watch what we do now. And if that sample size is anything to go by, this um, tactic of sort of playing out from the back and inviting teams on, trying to lure them in with their press to make a mistake, to play through it and then quickly, quickly attack. It's high risk, high reward, I guess. And we could see 
some serious problems with it. I, I saw an article written yesterday about how Conor Bradley was um, the reason why we didn't have to worry about what happens with Trent. And uh, no one's higher on Conor Bradley than I am. But if you're basing it off like this person was, the preseason friendlies, um, you're a lunatic because his defensive work was not up to scratch. Uh, at all and even his attacking work was not what it what it has been so he's a guy who's clearly finding his way into pre-season apparently he's done a lot of work on himself in the gym over the summer so it could be as simple as just simply adjusting to how he feels in his own um, new shape but the idea that you know Conor Bradley's the the the, the fix based on the pre-season friendlies that's really that was a really really weird take I certainly saw no evidence of that in those preseason games. But I will take anything that leaves us with a win against Arsenal and a win against Manchester United in any context. I don't care what we're doing. If we're playing them and skimming stones on the local lake, uh, I'll take the win. It's always just nice to win against those two, regardless of the context. And, you know, like I say, I really enjoyed that aspect of looking at the it's a systems game, right? Um, now it's just, that's what it's all about, and I just enjoyed watching how we sort of shape up um, and how we are, like I say, sort of interested in inviting teams on um, and then breaking through their press if and when they make a mistake. And the reason I got to Bradley there in my head, which is always kind of going in seventeen different directions, is because he's one of the few guys that I noticed who was, you know possibly at fault for actually making the mistakes and playing out from the back. This is where the high risk part comes in. And it is high risk. And we saw Cuivin being um, a little bit sloppy with the ball at his feet a couple of times in the in the, in the the one game where he, he, within a couple of minutes, uh, got closed down twice. That was a worry. I think that was in the Arsenal game. And you don't like to see that. Um, and so the the high risk part is going to become even more higher risk when we are playing against really top quality players in the Premier League. So I think you might want to, as Sam Jackson says in uh, in that dinosaur movie, you might want to hold on to your butts because it's going to be, uh, I think, pretty hairy at times. And there is no guarantee that we'll completely adapt to it. The one thing I would say is that we are now going into a situation where once they adjust to it, we'll have better quality footballers doing this thing. Um, that's exciting. Um, and it's really, really the big takeaway of the preseason for me is to just look at how sharp Mo Salah looks. Because I would say that's the one thing about him over the last couple of seasons when the pressure has really, really been on for us um, and there were things at stake and we needed Mo Salah to be the best in the world and he didn't necessarily always deliver in that way. He always did enough that you could say, and, and people do, with massive indignation, um, point at his underlying numbers, point at his stats, point at his goals and assists and all the rest of it. It's inescapably true. But we're talking about one of the guys. I don't need a VPN. I've got nothing to hide. <laughs> this is what I used to tell myself before I hooked up with LibertyShield.com. Not only is my home internet now fully encrypted, but I can now access all the websites I want, whenever I want, and do so from absolutely anywhere. As a Liverpool fan, I love to know I can now watch every match, regardless of whether it's on UK TV or not. My Liberty Shield VPN makes sure nothing is blocked and guarantees me super fast streaming speed throughout that match. You can get connected right now with their software package, which includes a 48 hour no obligation free trial and instant access to their apps for Apple, Android, Fire TV, PC, Mac, and Android TV. Or go a step further like I have and get one of their pre configured VPN routers. These small but powerful devices allow you to easily connect every device in your home to VPN, making it the perfect solution for smart TVs, Mac boxes and games consoles. Visit LibertyShield.com today and use coupon code AIVPN25 to get 25% off at checkout. Who it's been my greatest ever pleasure to watch 
playing for Liverpool. We're talking about a guy who has the ability to be in the conversation for the best player in the world, uh, uh, certainly in his position. And that Mo Salah looks to have turned up um, very much in pre-season. And that is very exciting because that means that we always have a chance in any game at any time, regardless of whether we're um, absorbing huge amounts of pressure and then there's a break which Salah's on the end of, or if we are in the other way, which we are front foot, and it's a little bit frustrating because they've got uh, a bank of 11 in front of their goal. Well, the guy who can possibly unlock that is Mo Salah. And um, it, regardless of what the situation in a match is, to have Mo Salah at his top, top form is incredibly exciting. Let's have a look at what's going on on the various websites. The main website has Cuevin Kelleher talking about how we showed how we could back up our performances and Cuevin's going to be one of the guys who's going to come into sharp focus over the next, what is it, 25 days or so uh, when there is a transfer window remaining open. Um, I listened to Dave Davis and, and uh, David Lynch earlier speak about this window and um, how you know there are things that kind of, as Lynch said, kind of have to happen. Um, not just with Liverpool, but, but, but with all clubs, because it has been quite quiet in general. Um, yeah, I, I want to believe that. I really do want to believe that. And we're going to come to that later on. So we will hold on to our transfer speculation chat for a minute, because that's coming down the line. Yeah, Keller saying we showed we could back up our performances, and that's great. And it's nice to see Cuevin, um, you know, in that number one position, in the absence of of Allison currently, I think a lot of people are anxious about Allison. Uh, when I asked for suggestions for things to talk about on the show today, one of them was, "Where's Allison?" Well, yeah, I know, I, I get it. And um, the longer we don't have him, the more you get to think about a world where he's not our goalkeeper. That's not pleasant. But with Yaros and Kelleher, we look to have a fine pair of backups at the moment. Uh, and with Keller, we know we have someone who can step into the breach and do really well if necessary and doesn't need to be a massive fall off in terms of the standard of the team. It's just that when you have, when you're talking about someone who's the best in the world, just like with Virgil or with Mo Salah, you're going to miss them because they're the best at what they do. And um, to not have Alisson is just not a good thing. Um, but Alisson returned to the team is going to you know, bring the future of Cuevin Keller into sharp focus and, and um, we know what he wants. He's been very open and honest about that as, as well he should be. I'd be disappointed with him if he didn't want to play first team football uh, at his age and to be a number one somewhere. So it's going to be very, very interesting. It's nice to see Yaros getting minutes too. Came over the second half there in the most recent match and uh, did well with a few stops. Uh, and, you know, that's the type of thing that. I've been taken from this um, preseason. It's all very positive. Yeah, again, just to throw a, a nod back to the earlier chat, there were times when we looked really, really open. And when those mistakes occur, as we're playing out from the back, we were possibly lucky not to get punished a couple of times. Not possibly, actually lucky not to get punished a couple of times. And so that's where, like I say, hold on to your butts. If that's If that's what's going to be happening... Um, there's going to be all oh, endless amounts of urine um, dribbling down legs uh, on Twitter. So just you brace yourselves <laughs> because uh, that's the likely future, I imagine, because the concept that we slip effortlessly into a new manager's way of approaching the game is obviously the dream, but it might be a little bit of a fanciful one. Yeah, so we've been talking about stuff, as you might expect, about how it's um, nice to have games where you make saves. He says it's easier when you're busy to make saves, so it's good to be there for the team. I need to mention Vit as well, that's Vitis Labiaras, who made some brilliant saves in the second half. There was a lot of efforts at our goal, and both of us were very busy. It's nice to see these games. Uh, it's nice to get these games, he says, where we have to show up for the team and show them we are here to help them as well. So, um full disclosure I didn't see much of the Yara stuff I did actually fall asleep despite my best efforts uh, to uh, stay awake for most of that second half 
Um, but yeah, very interesting to see that uh, Quivin's, uh upbeat. But you know, we're also very, very aware of the fact that he may well be at the door. But like I say, looking around the rest of the uh, Liverpool homepage here, the official website, and you get to see uh, old Darwin and Big Smiley Head and Virgil and Trent going through the paces, Luis Diaz having the crack. And it is kind of exciting to think about all those players back in the fold. Joey Gomez as well, who will probably come into it earlier on again. Dave and David on the Media Matters pod earlier on talking about the Joe Gomez potential um, for moving on. It's not something I want to think about. I'll be honest, I think Joe's a tremendous asset to the team. Um, and I mean the team as opposed to the squad. So it's not uh, something that I'm uh, very high on. Um, but myself and Dave on the Transfer Pod have mentioned in previous shows, um, going back to the start of the summer now, that there has been that kind of understanding that um, he would not be averse to a move. I think what we were hearing was to London, um, being a London boy. Uh, so if he could find himself a move somewhere where he would be first choice, um Lynch was talking about the England team. I don't know if he gives a damn about that or not. Perhaps he does. Um, as in, is it top of mind with him? I don't know. Um, I think, you know, it's it, that's by the by, especially the way the summer went there for him. For, you know, there was, uh, he was just a, a passenger for that entire tournament. I do think that it would be an awful loss. And I do think on the back of Joel Matip out as well, we'd need to recruit. Uh, again, more of that later on. One more thing just on the home page of the official website before we go is uh, the photo shoot for the new kit the away kit which was um, sported by the team against United in the 3 nil win there I have to say big fan I think it looks class really really sharp um, when you see them do this you wonder how they can go and do what they did with the home kit I, I, I don't understand I don't understand. Um, so we will go to This Is Anfield and we'll see what This Is Anfield have to say. Oh, uh, we'll go straight to the article by Jack Losby, which says that Arne Slot has given an update on transfers. He was asked about LFC signing a new number six. Now, brace yourselves for a lot and nothing at the same time. Um, so Jack says that Arne insists... Uh, quote, a club like Liverpool always keeps its eye open. <laughs> I get a bad, I'm getting a bad smell off this already in terms of vagueness. Um, but this is in, in relation to transfers. Uh, but he would not be drawn whether they will sign a new number six. Um, speaking to journalists later on uh, in the article, it says, uh, specifically the male's Lewis Steele, following the 3-0 friendly win over United in the U.S., Slot insisted that sporting director Richard Hughes is, quote, working hard on a difficult task. Okay. Uh, and Ernie straight into it, doing the Jurgen kind of thing. He says, quote, I notice you are focused a lot on new signings. Well, of course we are, Ernie. Stop being so deliberately disingenuous. What do you think? Of course we are. This podcast is sponsored by Ramp. Are you a business leader considering a new credit card and spend management system? You could stick with the old school process, multiple systems that work against each other and create more work for you. Or you could try Ramp. Ramp helps businesses manage their finance operations with a corporate card and spend management software that includes accounting automation, vendor payments, travel booking, and more, all in one platform. Whether you're a startup, a small business, or have thousands of employees, Ramp's intuitive software gives you maximum control over spend. Ramp's smart tools enforce compliance, prevent fraud, and provide real-time insights. Stop overspending and save up to 5%. Plus, Ramp automates data entry and routine time-consuming tasks. It's all done for you. You'll close your books in hours instead of days and give your team time to focus on what really matters, the bottom line. And now, get $250 when you join Ramp for free. Just go to ramp.com slash easy. Ramp.com slash easy. R-A-M-P dot com slash easy. Cards issued by Sutton Bank and Celtic Bank members of DIC. Terms and conditions apply. 
He, con- he continues, quote, I am focused on the tour, how we played, what we need to improve and what we did well. Like I said, the bar is really high for new signings because we have so many good players. It is not so easy to first find a player uh, to meet those standards and then asks, is he, ask, is he available? Then we have to find an agreement with them. So it's not always easy to find a player who can help us, but Richard is working hard on it. And let's see what comes from this. So again, thank you very much um, for the condescending explanation of how transfers work and how recruitment works and how we actually have a certain standard and we need to keep to it, both in terms of the player's ability and the fact that he's not a dickhead. And then also thanks for the reference to how difficult it is to negotiate financial terms. We knew all this, but, you know, this is what I was telling you to expect. Uh, Jack's article goes on, and but this is not Jack's fault, by the way, I'm very much directing this at, uh, at Slot being disingenuous, as I guess he has no choice but to be. It has been reiterated, Jack continues on a number of occasions, that Liverpool are only seeking top-tier additions to their squad, which appears to have complicated the search for a defensive midfielder. <laughs> Did people think we were looking for shit players? Waturu Endo seems out of favour having only started once in three games on the US tour and being subbed at half time in that 1-0 win over Betis. Yeah, that's a bad sign. That's a bad sign for Waturu uh, and his desire to stay and fight for his place. Damsa Bozlai, Gravenberg were preferred against Ar- Arsenal and Man United respectively. I guess... If you're a Waturu and you're seeing Ryan Grabenberg play in the defensive midfield role ahead of you, you might be thinking, I guess I'm probably out here. Um, and that's not a slight Ryan Grabenberg, but that's not where he plays. Asked specifically about a new number six, <laughs> Slot replied, Ryan did really well in that position. That's against United. And we have other position options, and we have other options as well. The best way to judge is when we have all the players back. And we still haven't. But a club like Liverpool always keeps its eye open to see what's available. For players that can strengthen the squad, and that is what we, Richard mostly, but me as well, are looking to do. But that is not particular to one position. Last week, I uh, excited about now a new number six. He continues, Arne does. We constantly evaluate the squad where we can do something and what we have. We have a good platform to build from. And not just because of this tour, Jürgen left his squad in a very good place. I think I said that before. Now it's up to us to keep performing like Liverpool did for so many years. And that is just as spectacularly underwhelming and vague as I expected it to be from Slot. I hadn't seen these quotes. I was kind of looking forward to experiencing them with you live. And yeah, it didn't disappoint in terms of uh, saying absolutely nothing. And actually, the usual managerial sneer at uh, fans and journalists for being interested in the idea of signing new players, especially when the need is glaring. And when you have a situation like that where Endo is nominally, you know, the specialist in that position, he's not getting a game preseason. I think we might be on to something with our questions about a new number six. But for Arne, yeah, he's just being as vague as you like. And I suppose... And maybe some people really like that aspect of things. Um, it is frustrating, I would imagine, for journalists. Pardon me, I'm just going to have some coffee here. <sighs> Tremendous. So let's have a look and see if there's anything else on This Is Anfield before we move to anfieldindex.com. Right. Huh. Yeah, I mean... <laughs> I think we'll just stay with our plan of going to Anfieldindex.com next because there's a nice segue here. Steve Smith has written a piece on Endo out, but who's joining the Liverpool transfer shakeup. Uh, Steve addressing this idea directly and he's going to have a couple of suggestions for us, which is going to be nice for us to uh, have on the back of introducing the topic through slots quotes there. So on AnfieldIndex.com, like I said, via Steed and Smith, we have this article and his, his first subheading is Lucas Gorda Duat and Alan Varela in uh, Wataru, Wataru, Wataru Endo out. And he says, despite my affection for the Japan captain, 
There is no denying that his last-ditch signing from last summer has not replaced the brilliance that Fabinho once brought. Inescapably true. As third-choice option, the former VFB Stuttgart man was pinpointed by the former interim sporting director George Smatka after deals for both Moises Caicedo and Romeo Labia fell away from his Ibiza-based grasp. (laughs) It's hard to believe that's only last summer. The crack we were having with uh, George... Uh, on Twitter was was actually tremendous. My ongoing assumption is that the new CEO, Michael Edwards, will take the the next three transfer windows to build a squad he truly believes in, despite the wants and desires of the new head coach, Arnie Slot. There will have been some conditions that would have been presented to the finer manager before he signed a contract for the Merseyside Giants. Ah, Steve here bringing the realism, talking about two or three transfer windows before the squad is perfect. That is obviously going to be the standard chat from anyone at all times. Uh, You never want to say you're the finished article. I think what we're talking about here, though, is a very pressing need for a defensive midfielder. And I think he's dead right, Steve, to say that there would have been uh, some caveats, shall we say, that Arne would have been presented with um, in terms of what he would have to deal with or work around uh, before taking the job. Steve continues, aging and regressing assets will no longer be tolerated. <laughs> that sounds a bit mean. I know, I know it's a new, uh, a new ruthless era, Steve, but what, we're going to take them out to the back? <laughs> pop, pop a bullet in Wachiru's head because he's kind of done. Um, but I, I totally get what you're saying. Um, he says also that signings that do not fit a data-driven analysis will also not be uh, tolerated. The previous purchase of the now 31-year-old Japanese warrior was always going to be something that was rem- remedied in time. But due to the departure of his legendary former manager, Klopp, it is now likely that the departed advocate of the 62-cap international will culminate in his sale. Um yeah, I, I think I think most people can see the writing on the wall there. No, no more so, no one more so than than Moturu himself. Um, and it is sad because he has come out publicly. He's never said anything but all the right stuff. He just seems to be a really good lad. And when he said he wanted to stay and fight for his place, I, I was I, I really admire that. Um, so it is a shame. But. When you think Tiago's out the gap, I know he was not necessarily available to us at all last year, but he's out the gap as well. Lenendo's out the gap. It does, for all that there's talks about bloated squads, we do need to address a real uh, player of quality who can hold that midfield. Uh, and hopefully Hughes is very, very busy on that. Like I said, 25 days left in this window. Um, and... You would, for all the caveats that Slot may have uh, had, uh, you know, involved in his in his uh, signing up, you would imagine any new manager, and especially actually, you would imagine this new backroom team would want to kind of sign on with a a little bit of a splash. So I'm hoping that this is going to be the very busy period, and myself and Young Davis will be doing a couple of impromptu transfer podcasts because. The club are about their work. We'll just continue on to the piece here where he talks about the targets. He says the most common links to an elite level uh, of player are that of uh, Alan Varela, Martin Zumamendi, Ederson, Manuel Ugart, all listed in my order of preference, says Steve. It would cost in the region of 50 million to attain any one of those destroyers with each individual offering slightly different attributes depending on what the Liverpool staff desire. Uh, I think I've heard most people talk very, very positively about all four of those guys. I know Dave's uh, fairly high on Pharrell and Zubamendi and Anderson. Um, I don't know. I don't think the Ugar thing is realistic. Um, but we go on here. In a world where the former Bournemouth technical director, Richard Hughes, accepts a bid for his veteran destroyer, that would be obviously um, end up the following secondary targets could be approached to completely reshape that number six position. And here we go. The aforementioned Lucas Gordadoat, Manu Kone, 
who we'll be familiar with from this time last year, and Ezekiel Fernandez, who has been spoken about quite regularly. I believe all three secondary targets could be attained for around the 20 million mark, which could mean signing two specialist holding midfielders for around 70 million now. I think Steve is um, saying things out loud that we're, we would all love and we all might think about um, and that we're all very, very reluctant to say out loud because I think the default setting is to be a little bit pessimistic about big spending and the idea of addressing it on the double, that position, uh, is very exciting. But I think I think for a lot of people, they would think it's a little bit fanciful. Um, and Steve goes on to talk about um, uh, the effect that Edwards' return will have and so on. And it's obviously because of Steve, well worth your while. Having a read of that elsewhere on the website, there is a chat about Liverpool's pursuit of Julio Soler, um, the 19-year-old uh for Argentina, um, who is uh, obviously an exciting uh, option as well. Um, and there is a piece about, uh, based on, on, on something Dave Davis has said about the outgoings, uh, Liverpool's summer sale price list, uh, the club briefing journalists. Let's just click on that because I'm curious to see if there's anything specifically being said here about those prices um, and what people would be available for we did hear very, very weirdly uh, a £6 million, I think, offer. I think it was pounds sterling offer for Bobby Clark. Uh, and I think that was thought about as being quite uh, ridiculous. But according to James Pierce, Liverpool have made it clear that Bobby Clark will not be sold for anything less than £12 million. Uh, He says Liverpool would want at least £12 million to consider even selling a young midfielder, Bobby Clark. Strong interest from Salzburg and championship clubs like Norwich and Leeds, but a loan is more likely at this stage. Carvalho, what are we looking at there? Ornstein reports that Liverpool have already rejected a substantial offer from Fabio Carvalho from Southampton. Ornstein's tweet reads, Liverpool reject an offer worth up to £15 million from Southampton to sign Fabio Carvalho. He's an interesting one. Did so well on that preseason tour. Looked really good. Um, had a couple of nice goals, and just looked very decent in general. Uh, very at home in the uh, artist slot system. And again, a kind of weird one. Possibly a little bit like we even kind of knowing that he's on his way out the door. So it's going to be weird. That's that Southampton offer was is a new one to me. I didn't realize that. Um, but it says, it goes on in the piece here, the stance indicates that Liverpool's demand for a higher fee in reflecting Carvalho's potential and their strategy to secure a beneficial deal. It's hard to give an exact figure, but you expect 20 million might make, um, that might start a serious conversation. Yeah, I guess so. Queen Keller, we know about his price tag because there was a bit of chat about this, uh, about it being north of £20 million, pounds, and though not explicitly covered in recent reports, David Lynch and other reports have made sure it's well known that Liverpool values Cuevin Kelleher highly with expectations for offers to exceed £20 million. Pounds. Uh, this valuation is consistent with Liverpool's broader strategy of setting firm price points for their squad players. Yeah, uh, who else have we got here? Tyler Morden, another one. Is being mentioned uh, at a valuation of around about twenty million pounds. Paul Joyce um, had something to say on that. Uh, specific details not provided in the images. It is reported that around twenty million pounds is required for Tyler's transfer. Uh, Red Bull Leipzig and Atalanta rumored to be interested in him. Seb Vandenberg, who has done a bit of moaning about his treatment by the club, um. Which, I I don't know. I, like I guess it's his life, you know. But uh, you do like to see people dealing with it, perhaps in a little bit of a better way, as other people in the squad have. Anyway, never as a player have been talked about so much uh, in terms of his future and his price tag. Uh, it says here, Vandenberg. Uh, this is from a Dutch journalist. Uh, Vandenberg will likely be allowed to leave if a club offers 20 million euros. PSV is not willing to go that far, but substantial offer has will be made to sign him. However, it's not certain Sepp will join Eindhoven 
as VFB Stuttgart is also interested. Huh, that's, uh, yeah, so 20 seems to be the magic number, whether it's pounds or euros. And then finally, Waturo Endo, um, the rejected bid signals potential departure. Uh, Liverpool have rejected an offer of 14 million euros from Marseille, which we knew about for Endo. And this would suggest, according to the article here, that um, we are listening at least to people um, and considering the offers that are being made. Um, so the concept that we are looking for a decent amount of wedge for any of our assets should not be surprising. I think it will, again, spark massive conversations on the hellscape that is Twitter because you're going to have people chatting about how we should let them go or get whenever you can. Everyone turns into an amateur accountant on that particular website. Um, so it's difficult to have a sensible conversation about it. I understand not wanting to undervalue your assets. I think that makes a lot of sense to me. Uh, why would you price yourself? Uh, well, why would you put yourself in a situation where you're getting less than, especially when you are this new ruthless management setup? So I think, you know, again, brace yourselves is what I would say for a lot of whinging, a lot of crying about several different subjects. But hopefully what we're looking at here is the beginning of the transfer window properly. Like I said, 25 days to get some stuff done um, that is not recycling vague quotes by Ernie. I'm not going to mention them anymore until something sensible has been said. Uh, you're not going to hear me quoting any of these guys because it is just the kind of guff that they say to shut journalists up. And again, it's that thing of like sneering at the idea of us being interested in transfer fees and journalists wanting to know I mean, that's just daft. Of course we are. Of course we want new players in. And, you know, when you have a chance to win the league, it might be nice to do exactly that. So I'm going to wrap it up with that. I'm back again for Dave tomorrow, who is having an extended two-day break. And why the hell would he not? Uh, So I'll be doing Daily Red again tomorrow. And then you'll have your favourite back on Wednesday. Good luck. We hope you enjoyed listening to this Anfield Index show please be sure to subscribe to our channel so future podcasts find their way to your device automatically. There's nothing quite like fan engagement, and we'd love to know what you think of anything discussed on this show. The best way to get in touch is over on our free Discord community, where both podcasters and listeners debate the hottest LFC topics 24-7. Sign up free now at anfieldindex.com forward slash discord. You won't regret it. You can also follow us on Twitter at Anfield Index and find us on Facebook by searching for Anfield Index. Oh, and before you go, we'd love it if you could leave us a five-star review on your favourite podcast app. It only takes a couple of seconds and it means the world to the people who create these free shows. Sports Social Podcast Network.